Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it is time for the Monday Q&A. So let's knock these questions out. First question. I recently switched to squatting without a mirror, and the movement feels so much more awkward and the weight feels heavier. I feel like without a mirror my technique is way off. Why has this happened to me? Well, the reason this has happened is because you've gotten used to doing something a certain way. You're used to watching the mirror, which means that you use the mirror as your means of judging your technique. And since you're not used to using your body to feel it, it's probably off different than what you're used to. It's going to feel awkward. And you're also not having your head track the mirror because one of the problems with the mirror, and this is the reason you argue against it and we shouldn't use the mirror, is that Using the mirror to judge your form can cause your eyes and your head to move in positions that you may not want, may not load the weight correctly on your back, might adjust your center of gravity because you're moving your head and neck around to watch what's going on while you're moving. So you've gotten used to using a bar path that isn't ideal that's causing unnecessary head movement and maybe putting you through a different bar path and different biomechanics that might be ideal for you because you've been doing it that way all this time and now that you're no longer able to use those eyes and it's not making your head unnaturally move in angles that aren't necessarily to your advantage it makes it feel awkward and weird keep doing it and after three weeks or so this problem is going to go away you're never going to notice it again and you'll be fine you'll be able to start using your body itself to do it now if you need to see what's going on in the meantime with it Get a camera, watch it from the side, do it from the front, do it from behind. Get some different angles so that you can evaluate if your form is good or not and adjust from there using a camera rather than the mirror. And that way you can maintain the same neck and head position all the way through the movement, which is really what you want ideally. And that's the problem with the mirrors is that it can change that through the movement because you're trying to watch yourself while you're moving. In three weeks time, you'll be so used to it that this problem will go away. All right, next question. What is more important in terms of muscle gains? The total amount of testosterone or the bioavailable amount? The bioavailable amount or what we call free testosterone is absolutely the most important. But you know what? It isn't important for you as a person to know that. Do you know why? You can't control the bioavailable amount or the free testosterone without controlling the direct testosterone. You don't have any means available to you as a person to make your free testosterone go up or down with something you do other than by increasing your total testosterone. You can't change the percentage, so therefore it's irrelevant. You can only affect the primary amount, and in all honesty, for the majority of people, at least 90% of you out there, unless there's a reason, something going on to where you're deficient due to your diet or lifestyle or something else that's causing you to be deficient, you are not going to be able to change your testosterone at all, enough of a difference to make a measurable difference in your muscle gains without putting exogenous synthetic testosterone into your body through some sort of drug. That's the only way you're going to be able to affect it enough to really matter unless you're deficient due to some aspect of your lifestyle. Like you've been cutting hard for the past three months, four months, you've gotten too lean or you're, you, you know, you're cutting with almost no fat in your diet or you drink too much alcohol. Something that's caused your production to go down. Unless you're combating something like that, it's not going to matter anyways. But the thing is, you don't need to worry about the ratios of total to free because you can't directly control that ratio. Even when drugs go into the mix, no matter what people try to tell you that you can, that's even hit or miss with drugs. So it's not something you really need to worry about, honestly. I mean, but for academic purposes, it's good to know that the free testosterone is what's important, but you can't control it. So it's purely academic knowledge is useful for answering a question on a test. No application for you in the real world as an athlete. All right, next question. Also, what's the number one tip you would give a guy that will compete in powerlifting comp in the next two months? First timer. Go into the meet, spend the final eight weeks doing every single lift that you do in the gym, meet legal, preferably get someone else to watch you to see what's going on, to judge whether your lifts are meet legal, make sure you learn all the rules. Focus on your first meet prep on learning the rules and getting the lifts meet legal more than trying to peak. That should be your primary goal so that you can walk in there confident that every lift that you hit is going to be within the rules. Also, if you get red lighted for anything, 
immediately go over and calmly question the judge who red lighted you and find out what you did wrong and what you can do about it next time. That first meet is all about learning how to compete and how to follow the rules. And that's the hardest part of the first meet. Worry about setting those big PRs and everything, your second meet. First meet's all about learning the game. So that means the prep needs to be focused on learning to be meet legal, meet legal, meet legal, follow the commands, know the rules, know what you can get away with and can't. And, and walk in and try to get nine good lifts. Don't even try to PR. Don't try to lift anything you haven't lifted in the gym, even on the third attempt, unless you just feel really good. But worry about learning how to perform the lifts correctly at the, the way the judges want to see them. That's the most important thing for you on that first meet. All right, next question. How long does it take roughly from the time you eat for excess carbs to be stored as fat? Okay, I talked with this guy in the questions a little bit down below. I don't, I don't think he understood this and a lot of people don't of what I've explained before. As human beings, you take days for that to happen. In fact, if you're not at a surplus yet, and you start eating a large amount of, of surplus carbs, no significant amount of those are going to be stored as, as body fat for at least two to three days of way overfeeding. By way overfeeding, a minimum of adding an extra 500 calories or 1,000 calories of carbs every day. And it's not going to be a massive amount even then, but it will take a couple of days before you start storing any more of it, more than just a gram or so of it as fat. So it's a misunderstanding there. On the other hand, when you're eating those surplus carbs, all the dietary fat that you eat, well, maybe not all of it, but a very large portion of it is gonna end up being stored as body fat because you're burning all the carbs for fuel. You have a surplus of energy, your body's gonna burn the glucose first and store the dietary fat for later, which is generally the way it does things. Body doesn't store under normal conditions very much. If any of your carbs or glucose is fat, it will burn it even burn it off as heat energy if it needs to until it, it gets hit with so much surplus for a long enough period of time that it will ramp up storing it. But when it is there and you have a surplus of carbs, it will be storing the fat that you eat. So that's a, a bit of a misunderstanding there. So the real question becomes is, suppose we really want to know is how soon will your body be storing the fat that's circulating around in the bloodstream from that you ate when, from after you eat the carbs? Well, potentially within minutes. All right, next question. When are training sessions not beneficial? Specifically, if you're feeling down, not clinically depressed, however, and as a result, go through a, a session slower than normal, but it's still getting the necessary volume. Are there any psychological, physiological negatives? And if, if so, how do you correct them? No, it's not necessarily any negatives. You're still getting the workload and volume in, and if you are, you're still stimulating growth. In fact, we all go through these days there's no real problem with it the issue becomes if you you need to determine if that depression or that lack of motivation is due to some other factor in your life in which case with some other factor in your life your training is not an issue your training just has to work around the rest of your life and uh, your, your stress and depression and everything else going on in your world but if it's something in your training it might be that you're getting stale you're, you're using too much of a workload not deloading enough or you're not able to recover enough due to a sleep or a food issue or, or some other factor going on, you're possibly doing too much workload chronically. And that means total work per session more than just the frequency of it at that point. Probably more sets, more volume than your body is really adapting to and the, that can be a sign that something is amiss if you're starting to get depressed and feeling really down every time you go to the gym. That's an early warning sign that you might want to reassess what's going on there. Not saying you won't keep making gains because you will, but it could be a sign that overreaching is coming or that you, you need to change something because you're getting stale. Particularly, you might want to scale the total workload back just a little bit and see what happens. But it, it's not going to stop you from making gains, but it in the long term it might if you chronically overreach, but that can take quite a while to achieve. But the hardest part there is determining, is it other factors going on in your life or is it something wrong with your actual training programming? That can be the hardest part to determine and that's not something I can answer easily just in this little short video. I'm sorry about that. All right, next question. Hey Jason, in a recent video you made about insulin resistance and high insulin levels, you were talking about the fact that one pound of fat stores about 3,500 calories. And you said, now whether this takes 3,500 calories to burn is a whole different topic. 
Could you explain a little further? Does it take more than 35 or less than 3,500 calories to burn a pound of fat off and why? Thanks. That's a very complex topic and we could argue about this all day long and get nowhere. The fact of the matter is the human body is not a perfect blast furnace engine that, that burns calories perfectly. Just like if you think of the example of, of a car engine, which you could tune, and it's not even anywhere near as complex as the human engine. Not even remotely. But it's a basic concept of you could start adjusting things like timing and how strong of a spark you get at the ignition or the fuel mixture of how lean or rich it is, and you'll find that the engine will burn calories, because that's what gasoline in the tank is, it will burn calories more efficiently, or it will put more fuel into the engine to be burned. Sometimes due to the way things are adjusted, it will burn it more efficiently. Sometimes it'll waste calories off the exhaust. So there's a lot of different factors here and the human body is no different. And to pinpoint and say that exactly a 3,500 calorie deficit will burn one pound of fat off isn't true. Sometimes the body expels chunks of, of dietary fat. Sometimes the body burns chunks of fat, little chunks of fat floating through the bloodstream inefficiently, expels some of it through various uh, waste products, unburned or partially burned, in which case you, it'll take less than 3,500 calories to burn it. Other times your body is burning other fuel reserves instead of, of body fat or dietary fat. And you're eating other things and the ratios don't always work out that perfect in the real world. In one situation, one person might only be losing a pound of fat for every 3,000 calories they're burning in a surplus in a deficit, and another person might take 4,000. It isn't that straightforward and easy, and it just isn't that simple and straightforward in the human body, even though we know that from a energy perspective, yes, that pound of fat, that pound of fat contains 3,500 calories of energy. But in all honesty, in many cases, the human body doesn't use that anywhere near as efficient as we might think, and, and like on the way a kilometer would. And I don't know, maybe it's something I need to do a later video on to try to explain further, but I'm not sure that my further explanation is going to have a practical application for the viewers or not. We could get really complex with that and it really lead to nowhere but confusion. Because the, the human engine is not an efficient burner of calories the same way that a perfectly calibrated car engine might be. All right, next question. Jason, if the novolipogenesis, which is converting of glucose into fat, or lipids, is not present in humans significantly, then would it be a good idea to bulk way over maintenance with just getting your 18 grams of EFAs? Well, sort of, but not really. Way over maintenance? No, I wouldn't recommend going way over maintenance regularly because it's gonna be easier to store fat. And the other thing is, how are you going to get only 18 grams of EFAs? Now, I've said that in the past, that yeah, in, in theory, that would be absolutely all you really need in a surplus, but the question becomes, how do you hit 18 grams of EFAs and no other fat? I don't think dietarily you could do it without an extremely restrictive diet, and that sort of diet is not gonna be maintainable, probably not palatable. You're not going to enjoy a diet to where you try to hit a number exactly like that and consume no other fat. You're probably going to need, even if you're loading up on EFA supplements, you're most likely to follow a palatable, reasonable diet. You're probably going to need 30 grams or more of total fat, even if you're restricting yourself to food sources that are very high in EFAs and supplementing the rest you need, you're probably going to need at least 30 grams, if not more, to hit that number while still following a diet that you can stand a palate. And remember, we're talking about small differences in body composition. Most people aren't willing to make that major of a sacrifice for long periods of time for minor benefits in body composition who is not going to make a living in some way off of their physique or performance. It's just for the average person, it's simply not worth it in terms of quality of life. So it's not worth worrying about that much, even though hypothetically, you would get a small advantage out of doing something like this. It's just not feasible for the majority of people who want to have a real life, whose life does not revolve around being a professional level athlete. All right, next question. When lifting, is there a point of no benefit after doing excessive amounts of volume? Is this the reason why squatting frequently on different days 
works to improve the squat? Oh yeah, absolutely. Look at it this way. Think of it as a point of diminished returns. If you're doing a various amount of workload, particularly if sets are taken within a couple of reps of failure, or even more so, it's just dramatically increased if you're, you're hitting failure. You get diminished returns off of each set. That first set, let's say you stimulate this much growth and adaptation. Next set, it drops to this much. Next set, it drops to this much. And each consecutive set you do, you get less benefit than you got from the set before. So it's very easy to see why doing endless sets is only going to give you very small increases and it's going to get smaller and smaller to the point to where it's not practically worth it because that's what we're trying to find the balance of between volume and frequency is how much volume can I get away with because obviously the more volume you do even though it's diminished you're still getting better gains better adaptation with how much is impeding recovery because if you came in and again you spread your five sets over five different days, you would probably get more adaptation from your squats, for example, than if you did all five in the same day. So you're always looking at how much volume can I get away with to stimulate the best adaptation, balancing that with how much will it slow down my recovery to keep me from squatting again sooner. Because if you can squat again sooner, you're going to get slightly better adaptations. So it's really a balancing act. So when people ask, you know, how much is enough? Well, I don't know. What's the right answer? How much can you recover from and still squat at the frequency that you want to get away with squatting to get the best gains. Because you're always going to get better gains from squatting more frequently, but if you can do more workload on the same frequencies, whether it's two days, three days, five days, whatever you're trying to do, you're still going to stimulate a little more adaptation. So it, it's really a balancing act. And with good programming and listening to your body and observing what's going on, you're able to balance that better. So yeah, there, there is no benefit practically beyond a certain threshold but it's not a simple answer. And the, the, the easiest way to answer that is, again, how much workload can you get away with or are you willing to do that doesn't impede your recovery so much that it reduces how often you can do it and still benefit from it? So again, it's that number is going to vary from person to person. It's an individual thing based upon your goals, lifestyle, where you're at in your training, how fast you're recovering. So it's a bit of a balancing act there. And it doesn't have to be perfect. For most people who are not trying to win a gold medal, you don't got to get it perfect. You can just get it close. You just got to get in the ballpark and base it upon feel. If you don't feel so good one day, maybe you're not recovering well. Back the volume down slightly. If you're feeling fantastic, consider increasing the frequency or increasing the volume unless you're on a pre-written program, in which case follow the program if you trust the programming of the person. So you don't necessarily need to overcomplicate this seemingly complicated process because in the real world, getting it close enough to get the job done for 99% of people isn't that complicated. You can just shut up and lift and pay attention to a few things going on with your body. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it has been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.